I want to do a, a territorial land acknowledgement. I want to be vulnerable um, and I don't want to read off a script. Okay. So what I want to do is first acknowledge that the land that we're on is of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, but I just simply don't want to acknowledge that. I want all of us to be able to, if we have the capacity to just look out our window, to look out a balcony, or in my case, which I don't have either, or I can look into Julian's screen and see 16 Mile Creek. Um, and so as I see that, I reflect the land upon which I live, I work and I play, and I give thanks to all that the land offers me and I honor the land that I'm on and the people who are the rightful custodian and caretakers of this land and us as settlers, we have the responsibility to honor the treaties and also um, take care of the land that is provided to us. Um, so that is my land acknowledgement. Uh, it's 100% no script. It was just all, all up here and also in my heart. Um, and, and today on taking on that conversation, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the history of Oakville or unpacking the history of Oakville, uh, which is as diverse as Oakville itself is today. Um, and so just some, you know, participation instructions before we introduce two of our esteemed guests today. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to use the chat box below. Um, if you want to ask a question directly to uh, our guests, Susan or Julian, just, you know, raise your hand in the chat box feature. We'll unmute you. You can always privately message Daniel or myself uh, if you have any questions or some technical issues, unless otherwise instructed, uh, please keep yourself on mute. And most importantly, let's respect one another and each other's perspective. And this program is being recorded as of right now. Um, so Daniel, do you want to do the introduction of our two wonderful guests that we have here today? Sure, I'd love to. So, um, so obviously today for our session of un unpacking the history of Oakville, um, Nabil and I are certainly not capable of doing so without the support of community. So joining us today, first, uh, I will introduce Susan Wells. So Susan is a member of the, uh, the Oakville Historical Society. Um, she has been a volunteer for over 10 years with the Oakville Historical Society as the vice president, and she is the editor, editor of the quarterly newsletter. So we're very, very grateful that Susan was able to join us today and can share some of her expertise and knowledge with the group. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Uh, and then next we have Julian Kingston. So Julian Kingston is actually one of our, uh, our colleagues, our Town of Oakville colleagues, and he is our lead with the Oakville Museum. So he is our go-to guru guy for all things Oakville history and Oakville knowledge. And as you can see, he is an active representation of being and enjoying Oakville as he sits over 16 Mile Creek. Thank you, Julian, so much for joining us and for, for all you really do in terms of maintaining Oakville's history and, and awareness in the forefront of, of our town staff. I can say as someone who is uh, an internal employee, we definitely all benefit from having access to Julian's knowledge, especially as we carry out activities such as this. So thank you guys, thank you both. Um, for our discussion, unpacking the history of Oakville, I wanted to start off at um, a really the, the earliest the earliest way um, or the earliest knowledge that we have of Oakville, so um, which is available to us. Sorry, let me just open up our questions here so folks can see what we're discussing. So I will direct this to Julian. Um, Julian, what's what's our what's the earliest understanding of the land which is now called Oakville, Ontario, and the people who lived here. Well, um, first of all, I am in a fair bit of wind noise. I just want to check, make sure you guys can hear me. I'll mute you if we have to shut you up. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's an evolution, right? And um, depending on the time period, our knowledge of it is, and I'm actually not really the guy to be the expert on this, but, um, you know, we know more or less about it depending on what time period we're talking about. We know that people have lived here as long as people have been able to live here, essentially, right? And if you look at the, um, you know, the way the anthropologists look at it, they'll talk about, oh, well, you know, it's post-Ice Age, it's 12,000 plus years ago. We've got, you know, the shores of Lake Iroquois where people live. We've got the Princess Point cultures. Um, but if you talk to, you know, indigenous knowledge keepers, they talk about how they've always been here which I think is a very valid perspective uh, as well. Um, so, I mean, we do know that 
So that's kind of where I start from. People have lived here as long as people have been able to live here. As long as it's been happening. If it wasn't covered in two kilometers of ice, people were living here. And, uh, you know, their lifestyles, the, how they lived, certainly changed over time. And we do know that, you know, between um, the last ice age and European contact, there was a whole, literally, you know, thousands and thousands of years of history that happened. And, and many different peoples that lived, lived here on this land, um, you know, for in more more recent as in less than thousands of years ago. Uh, we could talk about the Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee, the Attawandaran. Um, but um, up to where we get to know a bit more from our own kind of record keeping from a Western historical perspective is, you know, post-European contact. And certainly where we know the most about it is sort of after uh, in the late uh, 18th century, so 17, you know, 80, 1790s. And by that time period, there was a very, like, a long history of relations of established relations between Europeans. And in this area, particularly the Mississauga, the Mississauga where this is their traditional territory, I'm literally standing on it right now. Um, one of the things to understand, and I won't go into all the, the history of the, of, of the treaties, but... Um, when we talk about uh, the Mississauga, uh, we can talk about how they were kind of serially dispossessed of their land. Uh, I mean, they, their territory, if we think about the kind of uh, land that goes around the whole Gordon Hor Golden Horseshoe on both sides of, of Lake Ontario, that was their traditional territory. And um, as uh, there was more and more European uh, settlement and encroachment, their, their the land that they controlled shrank and shrank. And, and we kind of talk about treaties, we talk about uh, surrenders and purchases and uh, ceding lands. And these, that language is all kind of really Western language that uh, implies that there was something kind of like, uh, you know, voluntary and consensual going on when it wasn't necessarily the case. In fact, it wasn't the case. Right? So I don't like to use those terms, even though those, those are the terms that are used in the language. Um, but essentially, well, like where I'm standing is like the last piece of territory that they had. Um, the lands on either side of 16 Mile Creek, where I'm standing right now, uh, they had reserved to themselves as uh, their uh, kind of last piece of hunting and fishing territory. There were the lands on either side of 16 Mile Creek, uh, Bronte Creek, or, or 12 Mile Creek, there was known as and the credit, the credit river. And under Treaty 22, that was the last bit of land that they gave up to the crown, or uh, again, I don't like the language, but the land that they, that they created the treaty with the crown over. And uh, that was literally 200 years ago, that was in 1820. Um, and it was only a few years after that, that uh, William Chisholm arranged to both um, for the land around the, where I'm standing right here, for this land to come up to sale, for sale and to arrange a mortgage to buy it. And he acquired the harbor, the harbor rights and about a thousand acres of land around the harbor, which became Oakville. So that's kind of our understanding of where Oakville came from in terms of the, the European settler point of view. It was mm -hmm. this, uh, this kind of pr like pristine and, and you know, harbor that was full of p potential that William Chisholm looked at and thought, I could do something with that. There's a lot of like, you know, I could build some ships here. I could ship some timber. I can make, uh, you know, I can build a mill. We could ship grain. So that was kind of the, the, the start of the, um, uh, you know, the industry that became the center of the town of Oakland. And I think I've said it up. So maybe there's some questions or there's some other comments to be made. Sure. I mean, I have a, I have a question. So, I mean, understandably that it seems like in terms of our settler impact on Oakville ranges back to 200 years ago in terms of the last pieces and parcels of land um, being claimed or taken by settlers. Um, but looking beyond that, from an Oakville Museum perspective, what's the oldest thing we got? What is it? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we, have, we do have some archaeological material that's at least woodland period, so that's at least 500 years old. Wow. Uh, the oldest European bits good question i mean i we do have some pieces of ship that go back to the 1830s the building itself is the earliest part of the building is 1835 um 
and we definitely have documents that go back into the 1820s as well, like the indenture, like the actual like map of the town of Oakville and the the uh, like the mortgage that he had to buy it. So uh, yeah, our documentation goes right back to the like you know establishment of the of the European settlement here. Interesting. It is it is interesting, right, uh, Julian? Is there uh, an emphasis on the museum? Um, to maybe share some of that that history that's pre-settler uh, or before. I know we have we had conversations about that. Um, could highlight some of the uh, the indigenous history within Oakville itself. Yeah, I mean the museum's um, you know the the home base for it is actually in the Chisholm house, right? It's like in the house that the generations of Chisholm built, and they lived there for six generations. So. It, it, uh, and, you know, it was Hazel uh, Chisholm's Matthews who was really inst instrumental for getting the Historical Society. She's one of the founders of the Historical Society. One of the two of the big points behind. She got the first museum going. I mean, there wouldn't be a museum if it wasn't for Hazel. Um, she wrote the first history of the town, Oakville in the 16, which was also kind of her family history at the same time. So it's natural that the core of the museum's collection really have to do with the Chisholm family. But um, and particularly in latter years, it's become more and more kind of uh, more recognized and more clear that we need to tell all of local stories and not just the Chisholm story. I mean, that's sort of part of it. But I mean, it wasn't just uh, Oakville story. It wasn't just what happened in the 19th century. And so we, and in particular, and we like we've written it right into our our strategic plan, where we say, hmm, you know, we have to do a better job of uh, telling all of the stories. I mean, we're still going to have our core collections. We're still going to have the Chisholm's. It's still going to be part of that story. Um, but, you know, for example, some people, but not everyone knows that there's a, a very interesting, um, uh, there's a lot of very interesting stories around black history in, in Oakville that go back to the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And we tell the Underground Railroad story quite well at the museum, but we don't do a great job of telling what happened after that, right? So there's another 100 years of history after that that we can do a better job of, of telling. And uh, we, we don't do a good job of telling the uh, pre-contact and sort of the, uh, the early history of, of, of Oakville as well. So that's another thing that we've called out in terms of making sure that we're going back and we're doing the work with our Indigenous partners to, uh, to uh, do a better job of, of raising that awareness. Right. And I know we want to get to Susan and, and, and some of the questions we want to ask her, but I think it's really important, Julian, as you mentioned, that by, by speaking of all of Oakville's history, it's not, we're not taking voice away from other communities, right? Like the Chisholm family will always be a part of Oakville's history, but there are other parts of Oakville history that can be explored, that can be shared, that can be given voice to without taking voice away from other, other you know, history that we know of Oakville as, right? So I think that's a really interesting point. And I thank you for making it. Um, and I know, Susan, we wanted to ask you and your wealth of knowledge. Daniel, do you want to put up the question about what, uh, you know, yeah. Oakville has changed, but, uh, but Daniel, you want to go ahead and ask this question? Sure. Yeah. So, so, and thank you, Julian, for kind of taking us through that pre-contact um, to understanding sort of how the land was mortgaged and settled. Uh, so my understanding and, and looking in uh, Oakville census data is that up until about 1950, uh, there were far less than 10,000 people that inhabited the land. And then we see this huge spike from 1950 to 1990, um, where our population boomed over hundreds of, like hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so Susan, I was hoping you could sort of shed light on, you know, we have this background of knowledge um, now that, that sort of led us to the 1950s, uh, but what happened at that time that led to such a big boom in, in change in Oakville? The Ford plant built their plant in the early 50s, so people were coming from all over Ontario, different towns. Uh, so there was a housing boom to um, Ford her, held some mortgages on some houses. So it, there was really, every parts of their lives were involved. There were apartment builds, apartment buildings built and that the suspicion there, uh, like I can tell you which one was the first one in the town. Um, oh, can you bring up kids in an apartment building? Is that right? You know, they should have a house, that kind of thing. So it changed that way. There were the established families in the town and you know, here's this huge influx, influx of other people. So yeah, that changed. 
And what kind of like was was there was there a change in terms of like the culture? Because it, it sounds like, um, you know, there may there may be a tension in terms of they're going from these established generations of families that lived here to tens, hundreds, thousands of people coming to the land, building on it. I can't, uh, I can't speak to that. I, you know, I don't have that memory. I didn't grow up here. Sure. So. Yeah, I, I guess I mean, like we hear from families sometimes. So Nabil and I, in our work, we are traditionally doing like outreach work um, with families. And we've even heard from some families, um, and these were newcomer families, that they weren't aware that they were allowed to go to downtown Oakville. Um, so that there was like this separation of, you know, the highway or the river as terms of, you know, setting the class almost or, or setting like this, you know, social structure. Yeah, there certainly was a social structure in the early days. If you, certain people, if they lived on the other side of the creek, uh, they weren't allowed to be in downtown in certain hours and... So that was that was something that was active. Like how recently? Yeah, in the early days, yeah, that was like more eighteen hundreds. Yes, more eighteen hundreds. Okay, right. Would you? So when the like the Ford plant came to Oakville, um, seems like that was kind of like a game changer in terms of the population influx that we received. Um, was so so the, what were the jobs like of people who were living in Oakville before Ford came? Like was it a sem- Like were, did we have other? auto industry jobs here? There was an auto part factory that was over in the old tannery just just east, just west of the the creek, the 16. Right. Um, There were small industry, well the basket factory was a huge industry uh, that went up until the early 70s, I think it shut down, so it was over 100 years. Mm. And that came out of the strawberry growing and the fruit growing. Um, now, Susan, those yeah. those people that that came in then, like to to do more of the manufacturing job, where where are they coming from? I I believe it was just other parts of Canada and um, you know Ontario. So primarily, primarily the like the population boom we saw was from already European settlers, right? I think so. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Did you would you say like the relationship between Oakville, as we know it, like you know we're part of the Greater Toronto area. Mm-hmm. Um, did the was the Ford uh, plant? Did it cement like the accessibility where like, you know, Oakville could be a destination where people lived and worked. Uh, whereas maybe before that, it was just either you lived here and you worked somewhere else or, uh, or vice versa. Um, I think there always was people who lived here. I mean, um, I think say a hundred years ago or 80 lived here and went into Toronto. They drove into Toronto or took the train. I mean, to drive into Toronto only took 20 minutes because there was no traffic, even with, uh, you know, 55, 60 miles an hour. Wow. So there always was, you know, Oakville was a long time uh, a bedroom community for a certain class of people. Yeah, and, and what, what were those class of people? Because we, we know Oakville now as being one of the more prestigious postal codes uh, in the country was did Oakville always have this reputation? Uh, yes, from a long time ago. There's huge estates on Lakeshore on the lake, uh, massive estates like um, Ennis Clare and that kind of thing. So that that sort of ideology that we know today about Oakville was always the case. Now, how about for those workers coming in as as laborers? Right, like that, that must have been a shift in terms of like 80,000 laborers coming to a community that was traditionally, gosh. Well, there, there was a lot of laborers in town for the small industry, you know, like uh, the foundry, there was a foundry yep. downtown. Um, 
so there all there always was that the the the, the ones who had the estates um, they were a little bit separate i'd say Susan, I'm wondering if you can share, if you know, um, like maybe businesses that have been around since Ford or, or that have been so much so the part of Oakville that they're maybe still around today, like a, on, on Main Street or um, just that you might be even aware of that's, uh, you know, that kind of scenes that has seen the whole transition of Oakville. Oh, gee. Julian, could you think of any that are still there? Julian's still there. Yeah, it looks like he's taking yeah. his microphone uh, his yeah. microphone off. I hope he can hear us with the wind still. Yeah, downtown has changed so much recently. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I mean, th that's the interesting focus, right? Where even the growth that happened, would you say that what was south of the QEW was, was, mm -hmm. which was very much like Oakville and then the, in, the growth kind of happened north of the QEW a little bit? Yes, so that growth started when in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Julian's made so his I'm way back. to his office. I'm back in oh. inside now. I don't know if you guys can help ah. hear me. I was making a bit of a transition there. Um, I'm just racking my brain to see, and actually, I could just like shout through my door. Carolyn or Curator, that she probably has a better idea than I, I would. There were certainly like um, businesses on, 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 on Main Street, on Lakeshore, Colburn, whatever the uh, name you want to give it that were there for many, many years. And I think there is in particular like a, a hardware store and a, a pharmacy that were fixtures. Um, and uh, some of the current stores, like I think uh, Barron's has been there for something like oh. 40 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there are some that are still like very, ha have a lot of longevity. Um, the buildings themselves have, great and interesting histories um, and uh, you know there's a couple of them like the, the, the building that anthropology is in right now is a great example of uh, an adaptive reuse of a historic you know it was a historic bank building and now it's a great you know uh, very interesting redesign into a clothing store so I think part of what we see there is some of that continuity but also that uh, evolution of how things change as well. Is are there any other moments of time or moments in history? So Julian, you gave us a great idea of over, like how, how the, um, you know, the settlements of treaty and the mortgaging of land really sparked a significant change that, that changed the outcome of Oakville uh, forever. And then Susan, in terms of like how we saw the Ford plant again, marking a, a, a stark spike in change of the demographic and the life in Oakville. Is there any other, um, significant moments in history that, that really led Oakville to be what we know it to be today? Well, yeah, I do think there have been kind of um, interesting uh, changes and in, in jumps and things, right? And, and uh, if you look at even just like what the activity around the harbor, right? It started out as it's timber, it's grain, it was all about shipping, uh, you know, and it evolved into being, well, yeah, now we're not just shipping um, grain, but we're shipping coal or we're shipping other, other household goods. And then, you know, the market falls out of the grain, uh, you know, the bottom falls out of the grain market. So now we're not shipping stuff anymore, right? And then what is that? Uh, but, you know, there are, by that point in time, steamboats that are coming into the harbor that are bringing in travelers from, or you know, day visitors from Toronto. You can come in, and in the summer you can come to because we have this, you know, great strawberry industry, which can which can trace its roots back to uh, James Wesley Hill of Underground Railroad fame. Uh, you know, you can you can take the steamer from Toronto to Oakville and come and have a lovely strawberry social and then go back in the afternoon, right? So stuff that we don't think about doing today. Like you don't think about, oh, I'll just take a boat down to Toronto and, and, and you know, have a picnic and come back again, <laughs> yeah. right? So, but those are things that happen. And, uh, you know, today, uh, you know, and then today, you know, we had the tan, well, and, you know, Susan talked about the tannery and how that was, a, you know, it would have been a huge, incredibly stinky leather making operation, you know, for that was there for many years and involved into other types of light industry. And now there's, you know, a remnant of it that's become housing. The harbors are really these days, particularly Oakville Harbor is just about pleasure boating, 
right? Yeah. It's all nice boats and, you know, we've got nice uh, sailboats below the bridge and power boats above the bridge, <laughs> right? Um, uh, Bronte is very much the same. Bronte has a bit more of a charter fishing um, uh, industry that goes on, which is a nice echo of the fact that, you know, Bronte was originally um, more fishing harbor than it was. Well, it was, it was also about shipping and shipbuilding and grain and, and stone hooking and, and other industries, but fishing was really a strong element there. Um, so you have these kind of changes and echoes and cycles that happen. And there, unless we actually go back and look at those, at, at that history, uh, you know, you don't really, you don't really have a very good handle on it. Um, yeah, you know, one significant event would have been um, around just after just after the turn of the 20th century. There was a um, a radial line, essentially a streetcar, that was put out from from Hamilton to here, which meant that people from Oakville could take a streetcar into Hamilton or Burlington and ran on the hour. Right? We can't do that now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. We take the go train. It's not quite the same though, as it's just hopping on the streetcar. Right. Um, when I first, the first time I've, I've, I've one of my jokes is that I must, I like Oakville so much I've moved here twice. <laughs> so, but the first time I moved here was back in 1998, uh, and I was moving from Toronto. And the biggest, one of the biggest adjustments for me was I just couldn't go get on the subway. Yeah. Right? I could go down to the GO train, and if I missed the train, I was like, what do you mean the next train's not for an hour? <laughs> what are you crazy? You know, that's the same level of service they had in 1908. Yeah, <laughs> think about it, right? We want to keep our we want to keep our historical significance going, right? So yeah. We yeah, but now the go train things. station has improved, right? Like there's you can take it, like it runs at least on the half hour, if not better, now. You know, as as a baseline, and you know, we don't really think of that as a, as a milestone, but for a lot of people, that's probably been a significant improvement in their quality of life in terms of how easy it is for them to get from here to their job or whatever, right? So I always think it's about like, you know, you have to look at the, all the little details to try to figure out what some of these changes mean and not just assume that what we have here in the, you know, you know contemporary or modern time, whatever you want to call it, in the moment now is the best for, uh, you yeah. know, the highest standard of, of, you know, quality of life that's been around. The medicine probably is. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'd be really interesting to explore Oakville's relationship to other municipalities and its surroundings, right? Like to see, um, like, did it, like Hamilton, like did many of the people who live in Oakville work in Hamilton versus like Toronto or Mississauga? So that'd be interesting. I've never considered that approach, but just having a simple like LRT line, right, can can hugely increase a person's access to those communities and, and hence the opportunities that might present itself there. So that, that'd be interesting. Nabil, I'm seeing that we are getting close mm -hmm. to our 1230 mark um, and being respectful of those who are joining us live and those who are going to watch in the future. I, I'm hoping we can wrap it up with one more question. So in the coming weeks, Nabil and I during this time are going, going to be looking at other segments of, of the community in terms of us trying to understand how we can perform our job better by sort of knowing what has been done and knowing, you know, what should be done in the future. And so the last question I have for you guys is, uh, is in regards to, you know, what we have learned from history, what Oakville has learned from history that can help us direct our future. I'll leave that open to the group for whoever wants to take a first shot at it. Well, I'll, I'll take a bit of a shot out of it. I, I mean, I was just thinking about this past summer, right? And when we had um, uh, the kind of groundswell, the Black Lives Matter movement, and then one of the stories that came to the forefront during that was the story of the KKK march and cross burning that happened here in Oakville in 1930, right? And so I think a, um, and this is something that we're conscious of when we are talking about Oakville's black history and Oakville story of the Underground Railroad, is that you always have to look at that stuff in the proper context, right? And too often, if we look at take the Underground Railroad story, the way that narrative is often spun in Canada is, oh, you know, there was this terrible situation in the States, but up here in Canada, we had outlawed slavery. So people came up here and they were fantastic, right? And the truth is, it was probably better 
but I doubt it was hardly fantastic. And they right? had to stay on one side of the creek after the certain hour of the day. Yeah, exactly. So there, there were these, even though there was, you know, slavery was illegal, there were still plenty of racism and plenty of, uh, of poisonous social norms and things that they would have had to deal with. Um, and, you know, uh, the situation sometimes got worse before it got better. Um, certainly, the uh, if you look at the power and the rise of the Klan through the late twenties and, thir- and into the ni- into 1930 in Canada, th- it was a thing, and it was a thing right here, right? It was a thing right here in Oakville, and um, I think it's really important for us to kind of um, acknowledge that history and yeah. acknowledge that those echoes still reverberate to this day. Uh, you know. Uh, Hopefully we have made progress, but there's still uh, and, plenty of of attitude and systemic racism out there, systemic racism out there that needs to get addressed. And so if we don't look back, uh, you know, we can't look back and just kind of whitewash all the past and say, "Hey, look, we did this thing, we made it better." Yeah. We have to look at that whole kind of uh, the whole evolution of that story. And and we will be spending next week um, for folks who are able to join us discussing anti-black racism. Uh, in Oakville. And Nabil, you can speak to that a little bit more, but that's that's a great example of just where we need to be learning in terms of the demographic shift that's happening in Oakville now of how can we avoid the mistakes of the past, right? That's a great example. Yeah, we hope you know you guys are going to be able to join us. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a Janiel from uh, Black Voices Halted uh, joining us. But, but the, uh, you know, Julian, to, to what you said, I think it's, it's interesting as to where we're going. Um, I really think there is a narrative of Oakville that is quite different depending on how you see Oakville, right? So if you have lived in Oakville generationally, for example, um, there's a narrative you have of what Oakville is to you versus if you are somebody who might be of color who's moving into Oakville because of you know what Oakville represents being an affluent community, you have a different narrative of Oakville. Um, and I, you know, I, I think I'd be so interesting to see how those, where those things overlap and where those things are in contrast to one another and, and how can we be more understanding of each other's perspectives, right? Because, um, you know, there is something to say for living in Oakville, right? It is a, it's an affluent community, for, it's a safe community. Um, and, and for people who are moving into these communities, that's what it represents, you know, and, and what about people who are generationally here for forever? Like, are they a part of Oakville's history? What does Oakville mean to them? You know, and, and having those dialogues collectively, I think, would be a really interesting, you know, even an interesting uh, campaign, right? So to see, like, this is what Oakville means to me. What does Oakville mean to you? Um, and I think we, we, it'd be interesting to see what those things are. And those are learnings that we can take to be able to see what we, what we can champion and then what we can work on. Yeah, agreed. Oakville... Um... Just to bring us to a close here, guys, thank, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Julian. And thank you for the folks joining us either live or virtually um, or recorded. I, I think we have seen, um, and we can see it through census data and through history, that there has been a dramatic shift that continues to happen in Oakville of increase and change in population. And, and Nabil, you and I experience this a lot when we go into the community and we see you know, the increasing representation of visible minorities and new languages spoken. And I, I think for, for us as a, as a lesson on how we can move forward into the future is sort of acknowledging that this has always happened in communities. There has always been new faces, new people, new cultures coming to the community. Uh, and in Oakville, we saw in 2018, it culminated with Oakville being the greatest city in Canada to live in. I think an important lesson for us is sort of acknowledging, as Julian mentioned, um, that there are, there are issues in the past that we have had to live through. And there's, there's things that we've had to learn through that will hopefully lead us to, to being a, you know, a greater community and a greater city. Uh, and I hope that in our future conversations, Nabil, we can kind of build on you know, the importance of acknowledging you know, our anti-Black racism in our previous conversation about talking marginalization, for, marginalization of our Indigenous community members. Like these are all things that we have to learn from if we want to you know, put that on our mantle one more time of being Canada's greatest city. Uh, so I, I thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, as always, 
Uh, we appreciate the, those folks who attend our virtual programs. And our next session is Friday morning, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, Mindfulness and Gratitude with Christine Shopeju. Uh, so we hope you join us then for a, a nice way to start your, your long weekend. Uh, oh, and Kendra, thank you very much. Kendra from Halton Region, thank you so much for joining everyone, uh, for joining and you as well. Enjoy the afternoon. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye.